Awesome. Good evening to our European partners and startups. Good afternoon to the East Coast and good morning to everyone on the West Coast. I'm really excited to be here today with you on our last content webinar for the InsureTech Batch H. Eight, sorry. My name is Eugenio. I'm a senior associate at the Ventures team here at Plug and Play, where I oversee our InsureTech investments. Over the past eight weeks, we've covered different topics that are the forefront of what's currently happening in the insurance industry. We've talked about wearables, aging, life insurance, digital distribution, business insurance and interruption during the COVID-19 pandemic, mortality rates and new risks, as well as the impact of COVID-19 in the future of work and workers. But what we hadn't covered until today is reinsurance. And as you know, it's the ultimate link in what is known as the insurance value chain. As one of the most relevant aspects within the chain, it was fundamental for us to take a deeper look at how the industry is adapting to the new normal. So for today, we'll showcase four startups that are changing the way that we look and do things within the reinsurance space. But before we dive into the startups themselves, we have an amazing guest. With me today is Philip von der Schoenenburg. Philip leads the innovation strategy in Silicon Valley at Munich Re, a leading global provider of reinsurance, primary insurance, and insurance related risk solutions, and obviously a plug and play anchor partner. Philip oversees the team responsible for partnering with insurance companies developing new business models, products and services, and technology that will transform or disrupt the whole value chain. So with over 15 years of experience in the insurance world, Philip has built a career across three different continents and has seen reinsurance and its many nuances across the globe, providing him with a unique perspective on the future of risk management. Philip is constantly identifying emerging opportunities and building strategic partnerships with the world's leading startups and incumbents in different areas such as resilience, cyber, and mobility. So you can understand why I'm so excited to have Philip today with us and hear what he has to say. So we have a packed agenda. There's not a lot of time and there's a lot of interesting topics to cover. So let's welcome today's guest, Philip. Philip, how are you doing? Well, thank you very much. I'm doing well, and uh, thank you really for the opportunity um, to be part of this this great format. And uh, yeah, very excited to be here today. Not at all, not at all. We're excited to have you here. Um, so I wanted to kick things off with what everyone has in their mind. Um, how are you doing? How are things going? What is the state of the reinsurance industry with the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, well, I, mean, I think um, COVID-19 has changed all our lives and um, we will be, li be living in, in the new now. And um, so th there has been um, some impacts um, on the insurance um, industry. Um, some, some lines have been especially impacted here. Um, if you think about life and increased uh, mortality, but also like event cancellation, DNO or travel. Um, in, you see some some other lines which are experiencing lower uh, loss ratios, um, like to to due to to lower um, usage, such as motor insurance or uh, property and liability coverages for for uh, small businesses, where carriers are now uh, providing some some refund um, to policyholders. Um, I think overall um, the pandemic has has made people reconsider risk in general. And um, I think it also has reconfirmed the need for um, reinsurance, talking about reinsurance um, and um, to, to buy protections here. And we observe a, a flight um, to, to quality here. <clears throat> Interesting. The impact, and I think also the, like the, the economic losses of the current pandemic, however, um, have the poten potential due to the global accumulation to be much bigger than, for example, any natural catastrophe. Uh, that's why any kind of insurance solution can only serve as one building block and complement, um, for example, a national state program here. Uh, 
So as you're seeing how this is all shifting, um, you mentioned a few lines. What are your thoughts on what's happening with business interruption and travel insurance and ENO, for instance? Yeah, I think um, that's that's to, um, to be seen. Yeah, um, as mentioned, d these these lines are are impacted, and um, I think um, we'll need to look for solutions which which cover especially these kind of um, epidemic risks. And uh, I'll be happy to share some some more thoughts on that uh, um, <laughs> later on. <laughs> Great. And tell me something, Philip. How is Munich Re doing? Yeah, well, Munich Re um, will be able to withstand the financial burden of the, this uh, pandemic. Yeah? The group's economic position remains strong, um, even in the current circumstances. So this, this will allow us to support our clients as in the past and, and to continue our, our innovation um, efforts um, also going forward. I've heard you guys are working on some very interesting epidemic risk solutions. Um, can you tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, um, one of the first startups we partnered with back in 2015 um, was an infectious uh, disease uh, risk management platform. And um, Minigree has, has committed to making um, societies and economics more resilient yeah, against ep epidemic um, outbreak risk. Yeah. We've invested significant resources in developing um, what is an, an emerging market. Yeah. Evidence suggests that the outbreaks are occurring with ever greater uh, frequency as a result of also environmental shifts, such as deforestation, urbanization, and, and global uh, mobility. So in 2017, Munich Re set up a, a epidemic risk solution um, unit, a dedicated global team with deep expertise in epidemiology, in statistics, in risk modeling, finance, and claims management to provide capacity for public uh, institutions and private sector business, such as hospitality, manufacturing, retail, mining, and construction. Um, products cover specific risks associated with um, pandemics, including business interruption and temporary um, site closure. So Minigree's um, epidemic risk solution team is addressing a significant coverage gap, what we were referring to um, earlier, that traditional mm -hmm. insurance has not been able to solve. Uh, and that is a non damage business interruption as a result of an epidemic. Awesome. So you started doing this investment, say, two or three years ago. How does Munich Re promote a strong culture of tech innovation within a large company, especially during times like this? You were three years before this actually happened, right? Right. And I, I think. Uh, for risk, it's, it's, it's a lot about awareness as well, right? And I think um, this is something which is now, we're at a, a point where this awareness is, yeah, at a, at a much higher level than, than a couple of years ago. Now, how are we, um, how, how is Minigree dealing with, with, with um, the current situation and how, how, how we set up um, in an innovation framework? And I think, um, over the past months, uh, first of all, I mean, I think our IT has done a great job to, to make and allow people to work digitally. And that's a situation many of us know. And uh, to do this from home and, and but still on, on, a, on a global um, uh, scope yeah, across, across the globe. Um, talking about our innovation set, I mean, I think also here we, we started like um, early in, in 2014. I think what was a key here was really to have this, this strong and long-term um, top management commitment. Yeah? We have a global, uh, a central global innovation team as well as decentralized innovation teams with, is, within the business units who can really address um, um, local needs um, from our clients as well. We, we are taking a, a venture-driven approach yeah, with defined innovation processes, um, which allows us to have designated teams to focus on specific new business models. Yeah? We do not intend to build everything ourselves, but um, we have scouting teams around the world seeking really to find the right um, tech partners and follow uh, new developments. We have a corporate venture um, which has dedicated funds to invest 
And um, as an example, we've also built like a substantial data scientist team as well, uh, what we call um, our own data hunting team uh, seeking for, for new um, data sources. Um, perhaps you, I think in the intro you mentioned already a, a couple of fields, but uh, perhaps I'll give some, some additional examples. I think that was part of uh, an important part of the approach is really to have very clearly um, defined areas um, where we want to find innovation solutions aimed at solving fundamental problems. So what, one topic we're looking into is, is, is climate energy and agricultural uh, technology. Um, these are like fundamentals for the future of mankind um, and have multiple interdependencies. So the question is how can we really protect climate, ensure a sustainable um, power supply and feed the, the growing number um, of of people. And here, uh, that's an example where we really are looking for partners. Another area that's very tech driven is, is private uh, enhancing technologies. Yeah? Data has become the new currency as analyzing data gives business the, the <coughs> a leading edge. But um, only if, if uh, confidentiality and privacy are ensured. Yeah? And, and that's, that's a key aspect. So we're, we're looking for technology that enables and improves this, this confidentiality and, and privacy aspect. And the third example would be resilience. So natural disasters and dangerous people lives and societies uh, prosperity. So the question is here, how can we help to make people, communities and business more, more resilient? Wow, that's not a small challenge for sure. Um, Philip, I want to change gears here. Um, I know that you're a big fan of modularization of the value chain and reinsurance. Um, for those that are looking at us today, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is um, mm -hmm. and why is it so relevant right now? Well, I think that's something we're, we're, we're observing. Um, there's been a substantial rise in the funding of, of, of InsurTech over the past years. Um, there is... Um, we're seeing more and more module, what we call modular solutions um, across across the value chain. And um, the observation is basically that the insurance industry is finally catching up with other industries. Yeah, and new tech is enabling these these solutions. So um, today's value chain is 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 very complicated. It's it's very long. Yeah. So other other industries have managed to shorten this to change the value chain. So if you look at banking, for example, they've taken a lot of, of steps um, and uh, to change the value chain. They have embedded solutions today. I mean, you can, you can get money at, at a supermarket. Or if you look at, at, at retail, at Netflix, for example, I mean, you, starting with, with renting DVDs, then you got them per mail, then it's streaming, and now you're, and they're offering their own content. So, the value chain has substantially changed here. I think the other the other question is um, is there enough value added at each part of the the value chain? Yeah, um, and and also the impact of the technology on these parts of the value chain is 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 quite different. Um, so in distribution, we're seeing uh, digital platforms arising in underwriting, and there's an explosion um, of, of data. So um, you can uh, buy a homeowner's policy by only answering uh, one question by entering your address. Or um, for claims, there's um, remote sensing allows to, to, to uh, settle um, claims much faster and more cost efficiently. It's very cool. But you mentioned distribution and underwriting. How is reinsurance leading the charge here on modularization? Well, um, I think there's, there's a underwriting is, is, is a core aspect for, for also for reinsurer. Right and understanding the the, the landscape of, of the risk and and, and modeling um, the risk and this is uh, for example also closely linked to to claims yeah so once you you do an assessment of of a risk at the beginning if you have um, like a documentation say like uh, taking videos of, of a property having ha having imagery of that that can be a proof comparing it uh, with, with the claims afterwards. So there's a strong linkage um, here. Um, and I think 
so so this the the risk assessment the 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 is one of the core functions of um, of what a reinsurer does. For sure. Now you mentioned risk assessment. Obviously, with the shelter in place mandates, we've seen a number of insurance carriers that are being prevented from going on site and doing on site visits. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in order to inspect or assess the insured assets. Um, such as a house, for instance, or commercial property, um, this obviously hinders the ability to do proper risk assessment. Um, however, pretty much every policyholder now has a phone with a camera, right? Um, you were mentioning video as well. We will, s or do you think we will see a shift in sort of like do it yourself risk assessment now that people can't really go elsewhere, but you already have the customer or the policyholder in those places? Yes, I think that's that's something we observe, and I think the, the key here is really is there a benefit uh, for for the policyholder, but also for 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 the, the the carrier offering these kind of solutions. I think there, there's another aspect, and that's um, that's really the the amount of additional data which is available from other sources, and um, which which mm -hmm. will allow to to streamline processes. So perhaps. A very nice example, which which fits here, uh, is is um, is remote industries, which is an internal venture um, which which Munich re, um, built, which allows to settle claims in, in a fraction of time uh, and completely remotely. Uh. So, what if you could like inspect, report, settle claims in, in real time? I think that's that's kind of the question you you were asking, and it's. So this, this is possible by this remote inspection tool. It's a simple to use technology for both policyholders and insurers. It's a, a smartphone and a simple to install software is all um, that it needs. And the benefits is really the cost saving and uh, the real source saving for insurers and uh, the improvement of the expertise. So it uses the video, it, it can record like the damage, um, by 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 a voice interview, but it also check checks like the coordinates has um, has the ability to to uh, to have a high resolution aerial image as an add on. That's the 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 the, the third party um, data which comes here as well as an in, uh, in live uh, video chat by smartphone. So I think there are really different aspects which are coming uh, together here. So you mentioned obviously data is the new currency and we're going to see a rise or an increment in, in more and more data. But with this sort of shift to DIY, do you think that there's going to be an increase in fraud given that people are going to be recording the videos themselves? Well, I think that's to be seen at the same time. Um, take taking a video, um, in advance, for example, when um, when you do the underwriting, would allow you to compare it once the claims is is uh, is is made. So I think that gives you quite some assistance in avoiding fraud as well, and and, and using technology to um, to ensure that there there is no no fraud. Uh, um, mm. But I think that this is the, the like the devil is in the detail, and this is something which which uh, which which will need to yeah will need to be discovered. Um, yeah, so oh, definitely a trend that we're seeing an increase on, um, especially from interest from other corporate partners. Um, speaking of, uh, I guess fraud and um, malintent. Um, you mentioned how your team transitioned to working from home. Um, a lot of our partners are experiencing the same issues, right? Everyone is sort of sheltered in place. We went from being on premise to being at everyone's or each, each person's houses. Um, with that issue, there is, there, we've seen an increment on the request from our partners when it comes to cyber solutions. Mm -hmm. What was usually a very, very safe and secure um, net or internet within a company is now a not so secure entry point for hackers where everyone is now distributed. Um, what are some of, or, or I guess, what are some of your thoughts on this area, especially because I know that you're very focused on the cyber aspect of things. 
Yeah, so I think cyber is really an emerging and, and growing risk. And what, what we do really see is that there is an increase of, of cyber threat to, to COVID-19. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is happening. I can give you a number of examples. I mean, um, we see a high, higher exposure due, due to work from home. I mean, working from home, you, you use more uh, mobile devices. People are, are not uh, as critical, perhaps, uh, to ensure that emails are coming from, from the right person, which uh, like fosters uh, phishing attacks or the success, successful phishing attacks and ransom um, attacks. Um, we worry also that, that smaller companies will focus more on the functionality, so using specific uh, software, uh, which is easy, easy to use and not so much on, on the security aspect. Um, we've seen um, identity theft and, and uh, combined with unemployment fraud. So what happened here is that there have been data breaches at online um, unemployment systems exposing private information. And these have been uh, used to, um, yeah, to to apply uh, or file for for government unemployment uh, payments. And I think there's another aspect um, that's um, with the stress or the stress of, of businesses that um, there's less maintenance and um, lack of investments in, into cybersecurity, which uh, will have an impact as well. Okay, um, you, men you mentioned personal theft. Um, will will we see the rise or finally a rise in personal cyber as the risk is being transferred from the company now down to the employees at their personal level? Um, well, I think talk talking about personal coverage on on the cyber side, this this is also a question of awareness again. Um, so, how are, aware are, are people of the risk? And um, I think there are solutions out there. There, there are solutions out there for, for identity theft as well, um, which, um, which addresses, address the, the problems here. Um, so yeah, I think the, 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 this goes very strong hand in hand, uh, the demand and, and uh, the awareness um, in, in this field. Awesome. Okay, um, we have one last question that came in from the audience, Philip. Um, mm -hmm. Could you give us some further details on how exactly you are or Munich Re is addressing the non-damaged business insurance claims? Well, we have we have built for for the for the um, epidemic. We have built an own solution here. Um, I'm I'm very happy to to share more more details or or or, or link uh, build a linkage here to to the relevant uh, colleagues to to look into this into uh, uh, more detail. Um, I think it's it's a very interesting solutions with with a lot of of different features and and also op add-ons. Uh, and uh, to really uh, cover cover the, the specific demand here. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great, awesome, um, Philip. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm going to pass this on now to Rachel, our program manager, who's going to be introducing the startups. Again, Philip, thank you so much. That was super insightful. And Rachel, please, you can take the mic now. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much, Eugenio. Yeah, and thank you thank very you, much Philip. from my side as well. Really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Really great stuff. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this week, really exciting for startups for you. Um, and I just want to kick it off from now. A few housekeeping rules per usual. Um, please remain muted and cameras off if you're not presented. Um, and, and feel free to submit questions either through the chat function or the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here. Our startups will have some space after their presentations to answer your questions. Um, and please complete the poll if you'd like to connect with any of these guys. We're happy to introduce you uh, directly after the webinar. So, But without any further ado, I want to welcome Henri with Akinova. You online, Henri? I'm sure, surely online, and uh, just about to say hello and share my screen. Hello, so please take it over. That's great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being uh, with you all today. Um, so let's have a look at uh, Akinova, uh, a dynamic marketplace to reimagine uh, risk transfer in a dynamic risk, which of course is very topical when you think about reinsurance and accumulation of risks. 
So the first thing is to realize that, uh, well, over the last couple of thousands of years, our risk has changed, um, but actually not that much when you consider the four horsemen of the apocalypse, pest and war, famine and death, uh, is, strangely enough, they have changed, but not that much. What has changed is that the number of dislocations which fundamentally um, transform the risk environment uh, is, is much more rapid than before. And that therefore um, puts a requirement on the risk transfer value chain that Philip was talking about, which uh, tends to be quite long, to actually be able to reorganize itself very quickly. Um, and if it's not able to do so, then you actually find a client dissatisfaction. So the uh, cover buyers find themselves with a complex contract. It's more difficult for particular reinsurers to be able to understand the accumulation that they, uh, they have. And there's a lack of truly scalable capacity to underwrite business interruption, cyber, and all sorts of other uh, uh, factors. So what we've built is really to prov provide clients uh, a better service and actually fundamentally as marketplaces do to provide growth. And that's achieved because investors and underwriters can see that they can have a better return. That's basically because there's a better and more dynamic match of the risk to the capital. And of course, uh, uh, an access to the right capacity from the right underwriter with a better visibility throughout. That reduces, of course, your execution risks, but it also delivers something that's actually inherently faster. So to do that, you need to pull a few tricks. The first one, you need to get a marketplace where you can visibly understand what's being auctioned, what's being transferred, what's being underwritten in the contracts. The second thing, which a lot of people forget, it's actually you also need to be able to transform that risk into something that can be backed by the right amount of capital. That's all the clearing operations that people don't talk about, but it's all the stuff that's in the back office. And then the third thing, having the right flow of data to be able to animate that marketplace. So that's what we built. We built our Akinova as a regulated marketplace to have transparent price discovery, but also we bring to our users access to brand new, very rich data sets, which allow them to create products, and some of them are parametric, where the basis risk for the client can be closed very uh, accurately. The broker can essentially advise on new instruments and the capacity provider can understand really what they're exposed to and so can run their models very quickly. That unlocks new capacity. To pull this off, you need to have a great team, which we've got uh, with tremendous amount of experience around technology, capital markets and reinsurance amongst uh, uh, the team. Three of us have a billion dollar plus exit to our name. And you then, of course, need to be able to execute quickly. So since we got together formally uh, in August 2018, we got the, the team and the, the business backed by the industry. We uh, did a lot of work on regulatory uh, to make sure that we had the right uh, regulatory environments, uh, the right capitalization for the business, the right clients, paying clients, and of course, then do some trades. And we picked trades which are quite innovative and a little bit different that we'll see later. And then of course, origination. So we are already a truly multi-broker platform with a number of brokers are, are signed up to the platform. Now the key of course is to deliver that in a highly scalable environment with the right technologies. And so as you can see some of our technology partners here, it's really about delivering something that's regulatory compliant, that's safe and secure and scalable. We back that industry, but we are independent uh, in the way that the corporate governance and the equity structure has been done uh, from those who are using the infrastructure animated with data. So it's live, it's regulated. We've done some uh, power generation cyber risk transfer. We've done some cloud outage transfer. We've done some parametric wind transfers, risk transfers. And we're also doing now with a whole bunch of products being uh, uh, delivered to us, uh, including pandemic uh, related business interruption, uh, climate resilience and others. You can do your own contract from scratch or you can use templates. You can create your private marketplace or common marketplace. You can have rated paper or fully collateralized uh, transactions. And the origination is done in such a way that the process is very clear and mirrors very, uh, very closely what's happening today. Now, in terms of the, uh, the UX, it's a tremendously simple UX to uh, utilize with the regulated chats. You can actually see, of course, the depth, the marketplace, the contracts as they are being auctioned. You can, the capacity provider can see the supply curve. So it's actually uh, uh, done to the benefit of the capacity provider and the cover buyer themselves, as well as the broker. So everybody finds uh, something to, uh, to uh, work from and to be able to grow their own business. 
and it's also an ability to be able to very clearly understand what is uh, what is in the auction, what do you have in your bag, what do you buy, what didn't you buy. It's super simple to join. And of course, we would invite our, our clients and also capital market pa partners to join us. That's me done. That's uh, my five and a half minutes and I'm uh, waiting for questions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Henri. Um, quick question in here. Um, does the client receive an insurance policy from Akinova specifically? No, the, the client received the policy, it's intermediated through Akinova. It's essentially paper that's from those who are underwriting the, the, uh, the, the risk, if I can put it like this. What we do provide is template to make it a lot easier for people to construct. So instead of um, thinking too much about the wording, if I can put it like this, they have more of a standard. Uh, and then they can focus on uh, the parameters which are associated with the policy itself. Um, of course, if they want to start from scratch and start from a blank page, they can use our data room and, uh, and do that too. Absolutely, makes sense. Um, and, and another question popping in, um, a few marketplaces doing similar things. Why should carriers and reinsurance or, you know, platforms use Akinova? And the extension of that, I guess, um, can you speak to who you are working with right now? So well, we're working with a number of uh, capital market players uh, uh, on the marketplace, some existing syndicates, some existing brokers, some of them in public domain like RKH uh, and, uh, and Guy Carpenter. Um, some of them, of course, are some of our shareholders, uh, as you might expect. I think the major differentiation between ourselves and everybody else is that we have the concept of being able to trade the collateral and trade essentially over time reserving which is quite fundamentally different from just being able to say that you're an auction house, which is a very different proposition. So it's really about capital optimization, where if you have a large balance sheet and you want to, to trade, you can essentially trade that very effectively by matching the capital with the risk all the time and essentially moving that risk. And what we maintain is uh, essentially a register of that. So you can see if there is any systemic issues and you can very clearly, very quickly see whether or not you have accumulation issues, which is really the topic of the current conversation today. Right, right, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Henri. Really appreciate you, you taking the time to share with us. Reminder to anybody, if you want to connect with the team at Akinova, to please let us know. I'm happy to connect you after the webinar. Thanks. That's great, thank you. And next up, we have Greg with Relay. Welcome, Greg. Can you hear us, Greg? Yeah, can you hear me? There you are. Yep, All we right. got you. Perfect. Take it away, sir. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Let me just share my screen if I can find that. Find that. All right. Um, sorry, just looking for the screen here. A second ago. All right, I'm just going to share my entire screen. I apologize. There are many things open. Um, here we go. Can you see it? Looks good. All right, very well. Okay, well, I'm gonna build on uh, what Henry just uh, talked about because we're also into risk transfer. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a trend right now. Uh, we started two years ago. Um, so risk transfer is a $250 billion market if you just look at reinsurance. Uh, it's about 10% of the market size of the insurance market. Um, and of course, there is more risk transfer on the insurance side as well. Um, as uh, Henry also mentioned earlier, uh, sourcing capacity is getting harder. Uh, it's harder because it's uh, adapting to our economic and environmental conditions. Um, you know, due to the pandemic and uh, global warming, among other things, the market has just hardened, it's tightened. Uh, and getting in first uh, when you try to secure capacity is critical. Um, so I mentioned that. Um, the problem now with obviously what's happening with COVID-19 is uh, that the market used to rely heavily on personal connection. Um, and uh, uh, deals were done, whether it's in Monte Carlo or Baden-Baden for reinsurance or Scottsdale for programs, or you know, on a more permanent basis in New York and London and some other places. Um, whether it's in, uh, and, yeah, sorry, for dramatic effect, here you go. So you don't have access to that anymore. So we're trying to provide a through relay, a platform that uh, enables collaboration uh, in, in the risk transfer uh, industry for all the practitioners that are involved. Uh, so whether it's insurance or reinsurance, uh, whether it's facultative programs or tree in the reinsurance space, 
or not uh, really does allow you to increase your speed to market and the data quality. And so that's something that we heard from hundreds of users is absolutely critical in this day and age. Again, speed to market and data quality. Um, trust obviously is important as well, and we're uh, making ra rapid headways to try and replicate that trust network also on Relay. Um, so Relay is used by carriers, it's used by brokers, uh, reinsurance brokers, as well as uh, you know commercial insurance brokers uh, to organize and facilitate their risk transfers. So we replicate the existing uh, process. We don't believe personally in revolutionizing the whole thing. We actually look at the process as it is today. Uh, we don't believe that it's broken, but we believe that it can gr greatly be augmented and enhanced. And that's what really does. Um, and of course, it can be used by reinsurers to, uh, to respond to quotes. We've been selected by uh, Plug and Play as a top tech insure tech for 2020. Uh, this morning, I actually heard the news that we were also selected by Insurance Insider as a, a top disruptor in the industry. Uh, we, we're not a big fan of the word again because we think we, we evolved the process as opposed to, to, to disrupt it, but we're happy with the recognition. Um, we've officially launched in March 2020, uh, and since we launched uh, our facultative reinsurance administra administration sorry, solution, uh, we've had five of the top 10 US reinsurers that have now used Relay for actual real placements. And a number of bits of uh, placements have been bound on the platform. And that was uh, in the last two months. Um, one of the key differentiators, it may not sound like earth shattering, but is that Relay supports email 100%. And that, again, is not you know, blockchain or AI, but that's what we heard from the users. Uh, and that makes a huge difference. And what that means in practice is that you can respond to quotes on Relay for free by email. And so you virtually have every capacity provider on the planet that can respond to quotes that are sent to them through Relay. Uh, but why stop there? So Relay is the first self-serve platform in risk transfer. And what that means, you can go online and you can set up your uh, free account today. And that increases your data security even further. It speeds up your process and it gives you structured data. Uh, you can also upgrade. Uh, so if you go to our website, you'll see all the options. The pricing is transparent. It's subscription based. Uh, and that will give you more powerful uh, reports, uh, things like time to quote, quote acceptance rates, exposure by AM best ratings, which we integrate with, and many, many other uh, bells and whistles. Uh, Relay is also the first platform. And you know, I like to joke a little bit about that. Uh, but it's, it's the only platform that we think is, uh, is really user friendly for any segment. Uh, even baby boomers, we like to joke, um, you know, love Relay. And so we've built uh, probably the most intuitive interface in, in the industry. We're very proud of that. And we believe that uh, adoption starts with the end user and with the interface. All right. So uh, in addition to all this, really, uh, you know, is the solution right now in the market that focuses the most on the, what we call the production phase, which is upstream of the actual transaction, which is uh, really about uh, structuring your placement and being able to, um, you know, to, to, to collect documents, to digitize all of that information, to, to structure your placement, and then to, to bring it to market and receive quotes. So, We've become also the first licensee of the Accord Solutions Group, which means we can read Accord documents as well as PDF automatically. And we have a couple of big announcements that are coming in June. Uh, the first one is we're launching a broker module. So we're going to have uh, some additional announcements of partnerships with brokers in the space. Uh, and I'm talking reinsurance broker in particular. Uh, and then we have another announcement that, uh, you know, I will, I will have to, uh, to wait for, um, but uh, uh, watch out and uh, I'd be happy to answer any question. Thanks, Greg. So question in here. Um, are you guys currently looking for any data anonymization solutions and, and how are you dealing with any privacy uh, issues, so to speak? Um, so did you say data automation solution? Anonymization. Oh, anonymization. 
Uh, no, we don't really have that issue because all the transactions on Relay are one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So um, we do go through legal reviews. We've passed a number of them already. And we actually increase the security. We work closely with lawyers, Aaron Fox in uh, New York, to increase the security of the legal agreements that we have. So this is not really a, a, a major issue for us. Right, okay. And to speak to your last slide, how, how do you plan to get adoption with brokers? Yeah, so very good question. Uh, so we, what we offer for brokers is uh, typically uh, the system stop at the door of the sedents, uh, which are the carriers. And so what we tell them is, you know, white label relay and bring it to your clients and you'll be able to have more access, better access to uh, uh, more placement that you may not see before. Uh, fat placements for, uh, for brokers are an opportunity to sometimes aggregate uh, into bigger reinsurance uh, uh, programs or treaty. And so that's something that they're, they're interested in. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Please let us know if you want to connect with, with Greg and the team, um, either through the poll or reaching out to anybody at, at Plug and Play directly. Thanks, Greg. Thanks so much. I appreciate Absolutely. the opportunity. Next, we're going to hear from Pinpoint Predictive. Hi, my name is Avi Tishman. I'm the founder and CIO of Pinpoint Predictive. At Pinpoint, we noticed that the most powerful people predictions today are using literally thousands of data points per person, but it's only available within walled gardens like Facebook. When you get into a CRM or a book of business, the data is much more scarce. So that's why we built Pinpoint, which is to be able to open up that garden, take thousands of new high value data points per person and enrich uh, data sets to be able to apply that data enrichment and our AI to make very powerful people predictions, uh, to look at the propensity of individuals to engage in a certain behavior or not. So I'd like to log into our OnPoint platform, give you a quick tour, and share an example. Um, an example is of how we typically start with a technical validation is to onboard client data set. So here we're going to look at a back test to see how well we could predict whether someone would be a distracted driver or not. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fun example. Some of the more common models that we build, like policy cancellation or lapse, bind rate, propensity to misrepresent oneself, file a fraudulent claim, for instance, which can be predicted even before a claim is filed uh, for other uses. And any kind of binary behavior, whether it's among a policyholder, a prospect on an affiliate platform, or even amongst uh, an agent distribution network. So first, you can, it's very easy to download our software if we're not already integrated with your system. You just drop in a file and we will onboard um, identifiers and quickly anonymize them so we can do our data enrichment in AI. So here, this is uh, a data set showing um, after we've enriched distracted drivers, we look to see how uh, they compare and contrast on our own proprietary data, which are continuous standardized psychometric traits, machine learned from thousands of data points per person. And we can see, for instance, the most um, important distinguishing trait is modesty. So they were um, actually 26.3 percentile points lower in modesty than the median population score. Um, quite a bit arrogant. Um, they were, if we look at it another way, quite high on lax, which means low in, con in, um, in, in um, ah, it's, it's a facet of conscientiousness. They were low in achievement striving. And so we get this fingerprint that really helps us predict the individuality of people in that particular risk group at that time within this book of business. So now our algorithm is trained and it's able to write out a score for someone else on the book or an, a new person that we would see, whether that's in batch or in real time. So what we can do now that the algorithm is trained is score in this back test phase, the rest of the book of business. And we have a holdout of people with, uh, who are actually distracted, even though the algorithm doesn't know that. And um, we, we score all of them from zero to a thousand kind of like a psychological FICO score, and then we see how well we did in the back test. So here's 10 buckets 
we've divided our risk scores into 10. And the red bar shows the highest risk scores. When we look at the actual labels, we can see that we get 2.9x, um, meaning almost three times uh, more likely than average uh, is the chance of pulling out an individual from those risk scores and having them be an actual distracted driver. If we look at um, the top 5%, it's 3.4x. Bottom is almost uh, four times less likely to be a distracted driver than average. So you're looking at a spread there that's um, you know, over 12, 13x. Um, pretty interesting. So uh, we can also look at the distribution across the book here. And um, there's a histogram showing how many people are in these different risk scores from zero to a thousand. So if we want to say how many people are less likely than average to be a distracted driver, we can just move this down to a ceiling lift of 1.0. And uh, let's see. All right, so that's 65.6%, uh, about two thirds um, are less likely than average to be distracted. Um, and you've got the whole tail, so you're actually like uh, collectively 188% less likely. Or you can see how many people are more likely, uh, say more than twice as likely than average. So we'll raise this up to 2.0. And there you go. Um, about 12% are at least twice as likely, more, more than likely to be distracted driver. Um, so this is based just on our data. In practice, it's super important um, that a combined model is built that combines the existing predictors and really great to um, be able to enhance important models and really have an impact on the loss ratio for our clients. Um, so the combined model is then used again in batch in real time um, to make a forward looking prediction. Um, really, really fun. Would love to dive into much more detail um, and really appreciate your time and your interest. Thank you very much. Great. And we do have Avi on the line today joining us. Are you online? Yes. yes Hello. Thanks. Great. Hi. Absolutely. So a few questions while we have about a quick minute, um, but could you speak more to the risk score and what types of data points you're using to um, determine if somebody could be a hazardous driver? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very much data driven, um, just taking massive amounts of data points. The, the best way to think of it is kind of like what Facebook does, you know, all kinds of advertisers in that case can put in a training set of people who bought a product, all kinds of products. And when you have those thousands of data points, um, you just look at what makes them distinctive as features. Um, in their case, it has a lot to do with um, people's actions on say Facebook, but they're also um, buying massive amounts of data from other sources. Um, in our case, the data used as features is our own proprietary first party psychometric data. And underlying that are, are the thousands of behavioral data points. Um, of what the individual uh, is, is doing. Um, what, what's really interesting, because we build those combined models, um, as, and sometimes our clients do, but we see what the same data everyone is using is all the time. And there's a lot that has to do with sort of geographies um, and even certain demographics in, in, in some mm -hmm. um, geographies. So what's unique about us is it's truly at the individual level, um, right? It's no one's getting, um, you know, like uh, credits and debits based on where they live or what, what demographic group they're in. So, um, you know, we, we think of it as uh, kind of cleaner and greener, um, more specific in, right. in that sense. Right, absolutely. Really great. And, and one more question while we have a few seconds. Um, if you could touch on your, your process for engaging clients. Yeah, absolutely. Just to kind of simplify that, we like to make it absolutely like crazy easy and, and zero risk. Um, so it's, it's as simple in the first stage where we do validation of just downloading our application and dropping in a file. And, and that's it. <laughs> uh, we, we do all the rest. We provide uh, the back test, which is verifiable and allows our clients to actually quantify what their ROI would have been in the last year if they used Pinpoint. Um, and, and then, of course, to know what it is going forward, then there's a production phase where 
depending on need, we can provide back scores on existing, uh, you know, um, accounts on the book or prospects or, or, or leads or new applicants. Uh, it's also available in real time. Um, so that's, um, that's how we engage and we, we can refresh this um, quite often. A lot, a lot of our clients are not um, rebuilding their models as quite as often they're going back years and years, but you know, things are changing very quickly um, to the, the point of the uh, dialogue earlier. So, you know, we, we recommend uh, refreshing these models on a, a, a quite regular basis to have the best model that will tell you what will happen, you know, um, in, in, in the future. So it's right. better predicted by the, um, you know, more, more recent data at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. That yeah, makes, makes sense. Absolutely. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Please let us know if you want to connect with, with uh, the team here at Pinpoint um, through the polling or, or asking myself or the team. Thanks. Thanks, Javi. Thank you. And last but not least, we have uh, Will with Federato. Will, can you hear us? I can. There you are. Can you see my screen there? Looks great, take it over, sir. Great, all right. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Federato. And put simply, we are intelligence built for a new era of risk. Uh, what I really wanna do today is spend some time talking about how AI is not necessarily AI and how by breaking some of these technologies down to their very first principles, we're starting to be able to do things that we believe can move us from sort of a, a pinpoint solution automation paradigm to an actual industry changing paradigm uh, for insurance. And so I'd expect all of you are fairly familiar with charts and quotes that look like these, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But what I want you to take away from this today is that when you look at charts like these, these aren't signals that markets are simply inefficient, right? They're signals that insurance markets are fundamentally broken somewhere, right? And so today what I wanna do is focus in on climate and cat risk it's a fairly big part of the problem and one that's been alluded to earlier today. And now when I say the system is fundamentally broken, I want you to spend a second and think about what makes climate risk truly different. We're living in an insurance system that was kind of built up on actual aerial pricing and law of large numbers, which is the left-hand side of the page here. If I have a slip and, sli slip and fall here and you have a slip and fall a mile away, the fact that those were a mile apart, that's pure chance. There's no real geographical correlation there. But in the case of weather events, which are becoming a bigger part of the pie, these events come through an area that are 100% geographically correlated. And so why is that a problem? The reason it's a problem is because sales and distribution models, especially in the insurance industry where we have a big distributed sales force, non-captive, are likewise highly, highly geographically correlated. And that causes some issues. And we believe the problem today is so bad that as much of 20, as 25% of prices for this type of risk today don't actually capture the, the true price of the risk or even the basic operational expenses of the insurer. Instead, they're capturing inefficient market risks like risk transfer. And look, don't get us wrong, there are some great risk transfer presentations here and we think it's a huge fundamental part of insuring P&L stability. Risk transfer is not going anywhere. But if you've noticed, even as you improve your cap models or even as you improve your risk scores, the degree to which you find yourself doing risk transfer hasn't actually changed. And so we're asking the question, why is that? And at the end of the day, we believe that the problem there is that insurance has allowed two sides of the business to drift too far apart. You have very sophisticated underwriting models that at any given point in time kind of tell you, this is what the optimal portfolio should be. But sales and distribution lags behind that pretty significantly. Uh, and it really struggles to get those insights into practice. And so what we've seen is a digitization of two sides of the industry um, but those information flows aren't actually being put to use. And so simply put, we are the intelligence tool that helps insurers kind of map the sophistication of that risk and underwriting system into the sales and distribution model. And we really see those coming together over time. It doesn't make underwriting a, as a, a standalone process any more or less important, but we do see those two things coming together over time. And we do that by kind of enabling those on the front lines, really enabling junior underwriters to take a portfolio view of risk and ultimately come up with a, a paradigm of next best action in which they can be informed of what is the thing I can do relative to thousands and tens of thousands of data characteristics, not the 10 or 20 heuristics I can keep track of to make sure that I'm putting the right price down or, or making the right decision relative to my portfolio and my book 
so that doesn't all flow through into risk transfer and other inefficient markets. So, you know, we do that. We also provide a lot of interpretability to the underwriter to simplify uh, their ability to take that action, but still make the decision themselves. Uh, and lastly, what we try and do is we try and bring communication all into a single pane of glass. But the real secret sauce of this is to pull this off, you need to be able to unify data in a private fashion, as again has been alluded to today, across tens and even hundreds of legacy systems. And what's beautiful about what we do is that we're actually able to do that across your legacy architecture. We meet your security kind of where it is today, and that's an incredibly powerful capability because it means that you can deliver the types of insights with your data, never moving or leaving its individual firewalls. And that's true within single insurers, which have multiple legacy systems that they'd like to communicate across and take advantage of all that information. That's also true as you start to think about the role of MGAs uh, and smaller regional insurers who perhaps uh, are interested in collaborating with information but aren't willing to put their information into a centralized honeypot. We're able to learn on that data in place, send only by definition un untraceable information over a network uh, and provide that insight back to the underwriter in real time. So if all that sounds too good to be true, completely understand, would love to talk to you more. Uh, you know, I'd ask you to take a step back and look at the people behind this project. You know, together we're not new to AI and machine learning at all. We've delivered more than a hundred million dollars in revenue at a variety of different companies using these technologies. Um, and as a result, you know, we, we've really learned how to identify these patterns and we, we focused on insurance right now because we think this is just a classic example of where some very fundamental first principles innovation can add a huge amount of value. So if any of what I've just said appeals to you, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is right there. And again, we're intelligence built for a new era of risk. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Uh, one quick question in, um, because you guys are able to adapt to, you know, a client's data environment so well, what does that initial entry point look like? Maybe if it's a pilot process to full onboarding? Yeah, I think what we found really well is to try and find uh, a, a historical book that high, had a high exposure. California wildfire is a, an easy example. Um, then what we try and do is we usually back, back test. This typically ends up residing in some sort of specialty uh, line. And then simultaneously, what we like to do is some, some form of user testing on the side. In combination, combination of those two things, in our back test, we can only sort of show you if we could influence by X, if we could influence by Y, if we could influence by Z, here's the delta. But by also doing the usability testing, we're able to bring those things together uh, and give clients a pretty good view of what that, could, what that potential could be. Like we said, we, we find about 25% of Slack in systems. That's a huge bar to set but two to 3% can mean a massive difference depending on your book, so. Right, great. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but really appreciate you joining us. Please let us know if you wanna connect with Will. We're happy to shoot over some introductions. Thanks, Will. And thank everybody for joining us. As Eugenio mentioned earlier, um, first, thank you to Eugenio and Philip for discussion earlier, but this is our last um, COVID-19 insurance weekly webinar. Um, really appreciate you tuning in. Let us know what you'd like to see um, and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thanks.